In June of 2019, Intercept journalists in Brazil began reporting a series of explosive stories that reveal corruption at the highest levels of power in Latin America's most populous nation. This reporting also contributed directly to freeing the country's popular former president, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. It cuts to the heart of power in Brazil and takes on the country's powerful justice minister, Sergio Moro. These explosive reports are based on a massive cache of leaked material that was given to The Intercept by an anonymous source. And they feature conversations between prosecutors with the anti-corruption task force, Lava Jato, and the judge responsible for overseeing it, the now justice minister, Sergio Moro. These private chats reveal serious and repeated improprieties by the prosecutors, including what can only be described as collusion between the prosecution and the judge. Lava Jato, or Operation Car Wash, began in 2014, investigating a cartel between construction companies and the Brazilian oil giant Petrobras. The investigation showed a sophisticated system of bribes and kickbacks, with politicians accepting money in exchange for directing lucrative contracts to construction firms. The dawn of Lava Jato represented a welcome development in a country known for impunity and rampant corruption. For the first time, it seemed that powerful people were being prosecuted, and Lava Jato quickly became the most popular institution in Brazilian politics. From the start, however, critics have pointed at abusive practices at the heart of the operation. The operation relied heavily on plea bargains, entered into by defendants who had been put in jail without trial. Legal experts decried the trampling of guarantees afforded to defendants, and the operation relied heavily on selective leaks to the press to pressure defendants. In addition to the legal abuses, many critics saw in Lava Jato an unfounded obsession with the former Brazilian President Lula and his Workers' Party. The disposition to send powerful politicians to prison in spite of the many abuses committed, has made Sergio Moro a superstar and a towering figure in Brazilian politics, and his popularity meant that very few actors were willing to challenge him. While Bolsonaro was elected, Moro abandoned his position as a judge, as well as any pretense of neutrality to accept the position of justice minister. The Ministry of Justice he was given concentrates unprecedented powers with many referring to Moro as Super Justice Minister because of the huge power that he now has. It is impossible to overstate the impact Lava Jato has had on the political scene in Brazil. The whole political system has been shaken to its core, with the traditional parties of the center-right decimated in favor of Jair Bolsonaro's far-right movement. The following conversation between Glenn Greenwald and Betsy Reed was recorded on October 25th. Since that time, the Supreme Court of Brazil has ruled that it is illegal to imprison defendants before all of their appeals are exhausted. And therefore, Lula was freed from prison. Commentators across the political spectrum have credited The Intercept's exposés with creating the climate that resulted in Lula's freedom from Sergio Moro's prison. In Brazil, the Intercept's reporting is known as Vaza Jato, a play on Lava Jato, because in Portuguese, the word for leak is vazamento. Several weeks ago, Intercept co-founder Glenn Greenwald sat down with our editor-in-chief, Betsy Reed, to discuss the significance of this investigative reporting. Since this recording, in which Glenn and Betsy discussed the various threats of violence and retaliation from the Bolsonaro government and from his movement, Glenn Greenwald was physically assaulted on live TV in a widely reported incident. The assault was conducted by a journalist who is now a Bolsonaro loyalist. In this wide-ranging discussion, Glenn and Betsy explore all aspects of The Intercept's reporting and this new political climate in Brazil. It's also worth noting that this conversation was recorded at Glenn's house, where he lives with 30 dogs. So you may hear some barking in the background. Hi, I'm Glenn Greenwald with The Intercept, and I'm here in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, with a very special guest, Betsy Reed, who is the editor-in-chief 
of The Intercept, um, who typically is based in New York, but is here in Brazil. Um, you've been here a week, but I've been in the US for a lot of the time, so I'll take the opportunity to say welcome to Brazil. Thank you, Glenn. So you're here, obviously, in part because of the exposés we've been publishing and the mm -hmm. ongoing reporting we're doing. What do you regard from an international perspective as the most important parts of these exposés? Well, I mean, I really think that these exposés, they, they go to the very sort of heart of Brazilian democracy. Um, and as we saw in these chats, there was actually an abuse of power at the heart of this anti-corruption investigation itself. So I think for anyone who had paid any attention to Brazilian democracy, this had a really big impact on their thinking about you know, sort of where it stands. And then you add the fact that Lula was sent to prison by this very same task force, and Bolsonaro, and by this, and by by this very same judge, and Bolsonaro became president, um, and I think people, and liberal-minded people around the world are very aware of the dangers that he poses. Um, the environment, the Amazon, also gay rights. Um, and, and then you have the fact that Moro, the judge who is exposed to, to as corrupt by these, these series of, of articles, is the super justice minister of the country, right? I mean, he is, is the most powerful justice minister in the history of modern uh, Brazil. I mean, I think uh, from the perspective of the American left, they, they, there was always a sense that, that there was probably something politicized about the process that sent Lula to prison. Like, it looked that way from the outside, but there was no proof at all, right? And Moro had this, you know, unimpeachable reputation. So that's why this is so significant, you know, because it really, it basically offers proof of what everybody suspected. Exactly. So, um... One of the things that you've had an opportunity to do is to speak to the Brazilian media. In particular, you gave a very in-depth interview to a reporter with Wall, which is one of the largest Brazilian media outlets. And it was a pretty, I wouldn't say necessarily contentious interview, but he definitely asked you a lot of hard questions mm -hmm. about why it's ethically justified for us to publish um, chats that were originally private, albeit between mm -hmm. public officials, that the police, the federal police alleged were hacked. And it's the mm -hmm. first type of story like this. We've had, obviously, WikiLeaks and the Snowden story and the Panama Papers and the Pentagon Papers in the West. But here in Brazil, it's the first kind of leak. So having done that interview, having spoken and heard from other journalists, what do you feel like has, is the response or the view of Brazilian journalism about the work we've done? Well, I mean, I think that there there is definitely a recognition that it was very important journalistic work, you know, and that, that it has been the narrative, the sort of desperate attempt of the targets of our investigation to try to say, oh, this is somehow shady, you know, because there, there, there are criminal charges against the alleged hacker involved, trying to associate you and us with, with them. But I don't think that has worked. My impression is that has not worked. It's been a colossal failure for them. And just the other night, you know, we saw you get this tremendously prestigious award, the Vladimir Herzog Award, for um, a, named after uh, a, pers a, a man who was, was killed by the military dictatorship as journalist, a journalist, journalist in 1977? 1975, yeah. 75, yeah. yeah. And, um, in a totally horrific manner, um, and only recently has the Brazilian military acknowledged that they had actually killed him. They they, they tried to depict it as a suicide, they hung right? Him, yeah, yeah. They and hung he was him. a left wing journalist, exactly, and and an, an immigrant as well, right? Yeah, he was a Jewish immigrant journalist, yeah. so the, yeah. the, the similarities <laughs> are almost like very chilling. Yeah. Um, so although know. the entire evening was in Portuguese, I found it very moving. Well, I mean, one of the fascinating parts, and I think it's the reason why there's elevated interest in Brazil, not just because of the critical importance of the Amazon for averting climate catastrophe, and not just because all politics is globalized mm -hmm. and Bolsonaro has sort of become the newest and really significant member of this kind of axis of authoritarianism with the mm -hmm. far-right parties in Western Europe and Eastern Europe and the Middle Eastern Arab tyrants and the Netanyahu government and obviously Trump, with whom... Bolsonaro is linked on all different levels. Um, but also, it is kind of amazing that Brazil, 
was this success story that came out of this horrific dictatorship that was imposed in large part by the U.S. and the U.K. that overthrew the center-left mm -hmm. government in the mid-1960s and maintained this horrifically repressive military dictatorship for 21 years. And I think everybody assumed, because Brazilian democracy is 30 years old, that it was going to just go on forever. And we are really now at a crossroads. You have a president who supports the idea of the restoration of dictatorship, who mm -hmm. believes that things were better under the military dictatorship than they were under democracy. Um, and who says things like he threatens to, you know, deport you and put you in jail. Yeah, and says that, you know, our, has attacked our family and yeah. has threatened the intercept Brazil in all kinds of ways. In retaliation for this story. For the journalism, right. Yeah. So um, that's obviously something that I think is important to ask you about is um, it isn't just us here who were facing risk, but obviously the Intercept itself, given that mm -hmm. it was the news organization that you lead that, that was doing the reporting. And there was a huge amount of, which people don't really know about, they know about the work we've done, but not necessarily the support that was so critical that we got from the Intercept. So can you talk about some of the risks that the organization faced in doing the reporting and the support that was necessary to enable the reporting to be done? Well. You know, when we were doing the reporting, um, we did, as soon as we realized that this was authentic and we stumbled on some of the most significant material, I think we all sort of knew that it was going to be a really big deal and that there could be some very ser serious consequences for our own security and for our ability to, to continue to do journalism in this country. Um, so we took a tremendous number of precautions um, in advance of publication. There was like a whole journalistic effort to prepare the articles and then a simultaneous digital security effort. I don't want to go into all of the details, but and then an, an, a, another simultaneous legal effort with this incredible team of Brazilian lawyers working really closely with our First Amendment counsel um, in New York. So um, it was kind and of there's amazing. The, there's the whole issue of several of our editors and journalists, not just me, but others, including Leandro Zamori, who's the editor um, here in, in the Rio office, being threatened physically with violence. Right, and right, right. The, the whole physical security um, issue and you know just our concern about the, the whole team down here. So in addition to the digital security and the physical, physical security concerns, we also had legal concerns and we worked very closely um, our first amendment attorney in new york worked very closely with an amazing team of brazilian lawyers um, and you know we were prepared for the worst because you have to um, and i think while it has been shocking some of the, the hatred that has been um, shown toward you toward the intercept brazil team and leandro and and everybody um, and the, just the sort of random right-wing trolling and uh, the animosity from the right-wing media. Um, at the same time, we have not seen the worst consequences from the government that we were prepared for. There's been no raids, um, knock on wood. Um, and I, I think that, that in a way, we all came to regard this as um, itself a test of Brazilian democracy, right? And a test of the press freedoms in the Brazilian constitution. And one thing that, you know, is really remarkable to me, uh, something that I learned from um, working on this, is that those protections are fairly robust. More so than, like, if you just compare the Brazilian constitution to the U.S. constitution in terms of just yeah. what they say, for example, the Brazilian constitution doesn't just guarantee a free press, but also almost has a shield law embedded within it that guarantees the right of journalists to protect the secrecy of sources so that exactly. you can't be compelled, for example, exactly. to, in a, a way that the U.S. doesn't have yeah. either in a constitution or a legislative yeah. I mean, that's actually the dream of media lawyers in, in the U.S., is to have that kind of shield law. And they've been working for it for, for a long time, but it's never happened at the federal level. So, um, you know, and we've seen case after case of, you know, the government trying to subpoena journalists and get them to testify against their sources. Um, and journalists going to jail rather than testify. But in Brazil, um, there are much greater legal protections. Nobody even thinks about that. I mean, I guess yeah. the interesting thing was, you know, I think the question that we began with was, we knew we had this nice legal framework in place and rights guaranteed to us as journalists. Mm -hmm. And the question was, 
with this new Bolsonaro regime, with someone that we know is an authoritarian because we've been reading his messages for the mm -hmm. last five years in the position of super justice minister, whether Brazilian institutions were both willing and capable of applying these rights, right? You can have all right. these nice rights written on paper, but a lot of times it's a question of power. Um, and I'm not really sure how to explain the fact that I'm not in prison, that we weren't raided. Yeah. Um, what do you think was the key to, to, well, to that? I would say two things. One is that there was a tremendous amount of public support, right? And to like talk to people from students at the uh, Federal University in Rio, um, ECHO, um, who were really sort of so energized and like on the edge of their seats and asked a series of incredibly smart questions just about the reporting and all of the, 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 the what we brought to it in terms of thinking about the legal consequences of it, the need for di di digital security measures um, in advance of publication, and um, they really got sort of into the weeds and you know it, could, it, it was clear that they really appreciated the complexity of the journalistic enterprise and also the, the consequential nature of the story itself. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. a lot of people who saw this saw, yes, this is important, it's journalism, it's news, and there's a pride in Brazilian democracy. And uh, I think that, that that public support we saw in Rio at the Press Association mm -hmm. event for you in Sao Paulo. So at the same time that, that there's that support, um, there's also the fear on the part of the, the people we are investigating here um, that an overreaction will actually backfire. Yeah, turn us into martyrs or yeah. make them look even more abusive. And I think also a big part of it was that um, we ended up creating partnerships with some of the most, some That's of the true. oldest and largest yes. Brazilian media outlets who probably yeah. would have been quite critical of the work we were doing, but instead yeah. became our partners journalistically. And, and they've and done great, they, you know, they've helped us do reporting. There's Folia and El Pais and, and, the, and, and Wall. And, and, and Veja, and, and you Veja. know, like even media outlets on the right, like Veja, that yeah. have long been supporters of Moro, who yeah. apologize for their role in kind of creating him in this image without questioning him and the like. So let's just talk about the consequences a little bit, um, which is always what people want to know. How do you assess what metrics do you use to assess the success of the journalism? I mean, it's amazing that you're here during a week when the Supreme Court looks very poised. Um, they've already started voting and the decisive vote has been cast to rule that defendants can't be imprisoned until all of their appeals are exhausted. The Constitution already provides that, but this kind of anti-corruption fervor, this fear of Sergio Moro, um, prevented them from applying those protections and it um, has resulted in a huge number of defendants being in prison before their appeals are exhausted in contravention to what the Constitution says. It's kind of a signal of how Moro and Lavajato have been weakened that for the first time the Supreme Court is seems willing to confront him and mm -hmm. even a month ago there was a Supreme Court ruling um, that for the first time ruled that Judge Moro's conviction of a really important defendant, the former chairman of Petrobras, violated his constitutional rights, a, a ruling that can have ramifications for all kinds of people who were imprisoned by Judge Morrow unjustly, obviously, who was the most high profile case, but there are so many other people whose rights have been trampled over, who have been convicted as part of what appears to be a pretty corrupt process of the judge and prosecutors collaborating. I mean, as journalists, we all actually want to have impact. You know, that's largely why we do our jobs, but we can't actually control the impact of our work. Our, our real job is actually to put the information out there so that society can react. Um, and it often works out that way. I mean, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you expose something truly scandalous and, you know, th there isn't much of a reaction for one reason or another. This time, I think, you know, and it's playing out. It's still playing out. Um, and we can't control it. We're going to report on it. We're going to continue to do the reporting and also report on the responses that we're seeing. Um, but ultimately, you know, that's not within our control. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's funny. I, people always ask me to compare the Snowden story to this one. And um, there's a lot of huge differences, but one major similarity is that in the Snowden story when I first got the archive I thought it was going to be the hugest story in the world and I had last minute doubts 
about is are people really going to care? And we published it, and the world exploded, exceeded mm -hmm. all of our expectations. And exactly the same thing happened here. Um, you know, yes, Lou is still in prison. Moro is still the justice minister for now. Um, but the story has dominated headlines here. It has completely shifted perceptions about the most powerful actors in the society. And it's given judicial and congressional and media institutions for the first time the courage to challenge um, these incredibly powerful actors who are the linchpin of the Bolsonaro government. So I have heard that from a number of Brazilians who are very supportive of our work. Like they're, they're frustrated that there hasn't been more consequence for the, the people involved because it does seem very shocking like you know that they would do this and they'd still maintain their positions but I mean fr from where I sit it just looks like this that, that the wheels are turning and it's going to take some time and the, the fact that this first of all the fact that this stuff is out there has transformed public consciousness right people really have a different understanding now of the what happened with with the car wash task force and Lula and I think it's going to have a big political impact. Um, yeah, and there's, a, there, there's an expectation that Del Pan Daniel, who's the chief prosecutor nominally at least, it was really Moro who was the chief, but he was the nominal chief prosecutor, is almost certain to be disciplined and removed from his position. So obviously we've only been reporting four months. We have a lot more reporting to do. Um, and that's in contrast to the five years of kind of the religiosity surrounding Abajatu and the way in which this imagery has been built up, but I do think the entire conversation has radically changed um, as a result of the reporting that we've d done and will continue to change as, as we keep doing the reporting. Yeah, and I think we have, there's definitely more to come. Yeah, um, so just to, to conclude, um, it's interesting The Intercept is now almost six years old. Mm -hmm. um, you joined essentially at the end of 2014, the beginning of 2015 at a mm -hmm. time when it was very unstable and mm -hmm. for, for me it were the key, was the key to, to, to stabilizing and then growing it into what it's become. Um, how, how just as someone who was there pretty early on and, and a participant in and a key um, player in shaping the vision of what The Intercept wanted to bring to the world journalistically. How does this story and this archive and these exposés um, fit in with mm -hmm. that vision? I mean, I think that from the minute I, you know, I learned about it and we talked about it on the phone, I, I could see that it, was, it fit in perfectly. And it actually aligned with everything that we've been doing. Um, it, you know, it, it, it is about the abuse of power. It is about an archive that you know has sensitive material that takes a lot of work to um, authenticate. It takes a lot of reporting. But we're putting it in context and we're making sure it's real. Um, we're giving people a chance to respond, you know, when um, they can shed light on the material. So um, it, it 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 we had practiced this stuff, you know, on many other archives, you know, not just the Snowden archive, right. but, you know, other archives, the drone papers, the drone yeah. papers um, and, you know, we had the digital security specialists in place, we had the First Amendment expertise, well, and, the, you know, and a, a new group of Brazilian lawyers to advise us on the Brazilian Constitution. And, I mean, just as a political matter, it, it I feel like it was the perfect story for us, right? Yeah, because it yeah. really, it showed... I mean, obviously, central to our mission is to fight against corruption, to do journalism that exposes corruption. So the fact that there, you have a task force dedicated to that, that it's itself engaging in, in corrupt behavior, yeah. um, I think was made it critically important um, for us to kind of play the role of creating more transparency and hopefully some accountability as a result of that, so. Yeah, and I think the thing for me that I'm most proud of in, in terms of the work that we've been able to do here is that for decades, the problem with Brazilian politics and journalism democracy has been that it's been dominated by a tiny handful of huge media conglomerates owned by extremely wealthy industrial families with very homogenized political views and they've monopolized the dissemination of information and part of, as you know, what we wanted to do when we opened the kind of branch in Brazil of The Intercept in 2016 was bring our brand of journalism here and kind of expand what the possibilities for journalism can be. And I think we really altered the conversation, um, not just about Lava Jato and corruption, but about mm -hmm. the role of journalism 
in yeah, democracy. Yeah, and, and we've assembled a team of really amazing reporters down here. Mostly young, were, incredibly yeah. courageous ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, I know from the Snowden reporting, um, it's funny because when I began writing about politics, the thing I hated most was editors. Um, and then the <laughs> lesson I learned was that you actually can't do important, in-depth investigative reporting without a team of amazing editors and huge amounts of support. Um, and so, although I still have some resistance yeah. to yeah, editors. Yeah, I'm gonna like take this clip and like, you know, send it to you and play it back to you. <laughs> exactly, no, here, it's my, one of my very few pay-ons for the importance of, of, of editors. Um, but really, the, this reporting would have been completely impossible without the complete and very courageous support of the entire Intercept infrastructure in the U.S. Um, so all of us are really appreciative. Yeah, well, it was a, a privilege to work on it. Well, it's uh, great to have you here. Yeah. Um, and it's been great to talk to you about this. And I'm sure we'll continue the conversation as the reporting continues to unfold. Thanks, Glenn. All right. Thank you, Betsy.